Hey guys, Gioco Piano, or the way I like to call it more Italian opening. We're gonna immediately get straight to the point. So after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, and bishop c5. I like to call this variation Italian opening. Uh, it's a very common one. Last time I taught you how to play fried liver attack against three knights if they play knight f6. So if you like to check this one, check like the fried liver attack and the video that we did last week. Uh, tonight I'm going to uh, teach you how to play against bishop c5. Uh, by the way, we're getting closer to one more opening that most of you would like to uh, play with the white pieces. I'm pretty sure about that. It's called Evans Gambit. And Evans Gambit we're going to cover in one of the future lessons. So let's get started. Uh, recently, uh, of course, you always play c3 in order to fight for the center and to play d4. Practically all moves by black are bad except knight f6. Knight f6 is the main line. We're briefly going to check how to punish your opponents if they play four, queen e7, bishop b6, and d6. And after knight f6, I'm going to show you the lines with d4. Full of tricks and very, very unexpected sacrifices and uh, sneaky opening traps by white. So after you play c3, they can play following four moves. Let's get started with queen e7. I don't think many people will play that against you, but if that happens, uh, people like to think like they can hardly play d4 now because e4 is gonna hang. Don't worry about that, you anyways play d4. So once again, and let me just make the a long story short, whatever they do, on any C, after you do c3 and whatever they do, you just want to go with d4 next. So queen e7, you go d4. They take, you play castles. Of course, for all of you who just started to play chess or for some reason are kind of blind today, you know, like you don't see any any tricks. Queen e4, rook e1, and you just take advantage of the queen and the king on the same rank. Uh, for example, a couple of my students in the past had their games with d3. Like, hey man, I don't want to help your knight to get developed, I'm gonna play d3. Don't worry, looks tricky, but when you play e5, you also say, okay man, but now I'm not gonna let you go with d6 or knight f6, or you just, uh, you're just gonna have like lots of problems with the further development. That's why I believe that most of your opponents will take. You take by knight, all of a sudden you threaten knight c3. Now you see the drawback of having the queen on e7. After knight f6, we once again take advantage of open file and king and uh, exposed king on e8. So they can't take, of course, because of rook e1. And once again, you uh, take this queen. And in case of e5, and they just go with knight g4, uh, looks like... Aha, uh -huh, now we're gonna have some problems to play rook e1 because f2, that rook is gonna be tied up for the f2 pawn and the e5 is hanging. You just go with knight d5 and boom, they can practically, uh, they're going to practically have lots of difficulties because the king is still uh, uncastled. Knight on g4 is bad. Uh, they have problems. They can't play f6 because it would immediately open up the bishop on c4 and you're just so much better. Instead of queen e7, they can now go with bishop b6. Uh, pretty big amount of players like to do this bishop b6 retreating idea because after bishop b6 they think like if white plays d4 and that's definitely what we're gonna do, now the bishop won't be under the attack and they all think like okay and now we can easily develop this knight and all we need is just to make castle and that's it. Well, that's gonna hardly happen because we go with d5. And usually, watching the games of my students, uh, weaker players, lower rated guys, I notice that like 90% of the guys go with this knight on a5. You bring the bishop back to d3 and don't forget, 
all of a sudden, right now, you trap in B4 to trap the knight on A5. So they have to do some sort of defense against that knight uh, for that knight. So if they play queen e7 to prevent b4, no big deal, man. I'm gonna play castle. You can play d6 because I'll play d4 before sorry, and the knight is trapped. You can play short castle because I play b4, trapping up your knight. And when you take by queen, sorry, but bishop a3 uh, is going to win an exchange, and white is winning. And in case they play c5, you just go with d6, which, which is a killer move, which prevents both queen c7, queen e7, threaten z5 and bishop g5. Look at this terrible placement of the black pieces. Uh, while well, we absolutely have like e5, bishop g5, uh, with a crushing attack on the king's side. Then fourth move d6. Very common in practice. Uh, lots of guys like to do it and then when you do d4 that's why we played c3 once again they have two approaches uh, to play e takes d4 what majority of players will do or play bishop b6 if they do this retreating move bishop b6 you take and when they play like <clears throat> sorry when they take by pawn you take on d8 they can't take by king because of bishop f7 they can't take by knight because of knight e5 so they have to take by knight and if they take by knight i can give you like few seconds here for the basic tactics bishop f7 you use the deflection and win um, in the uh, worst case scenario pawn and of course you just break the possibility for your opponent to castle if they take you just take on d4 uh, they gotta go with bishop e6 or bishop e4. Bishop e4 gives you a nice developing move afterwards with castle. Watch out, a very annoying uh, pin could be bishop g4 against the d4 opponent. That's why we either want to face that with or prevent that with h3 or want to face any bishop g4 with the bishop e5 afterwards. So after like uh, bishop e6, because they keep pressuring this pawn on d4, I like bishop b5. I don't, I mean, knight c3 is normal developing move, and when they play bishop g4, you just have to be all the time to find harder to keep these pawns in the healthy pawn structure, because they have both threats. Knight takes d4, and bishop takes f3, winning the d4 pawn afterwards. So, in my opinion, way better is bishop b5 move. It's a difficult move. Uh, not many of you would play, even I, I'm not sure if I would consider that move if, of course, I didn't know the theory. So after like bishop b5, uh, they just go with uh, bishop d7, castles, knight f6, knight c3, castles, and you do h3. There is a very nice point of this h3 move. It gives you an easy development afterwards with a rookie one, bishop f4 and bishop g5. It prevents bishop g4 by black. And uh, I just have to show you how do you have to play with this mobile but at the same time shaky center so when they play h6 rookie one rookie eight a very important move here is a3 watch out i'd like to bring my light square bishop back to c2 to line it up and create a battery with the queen d3 to place my dark square bishop on f4 so i can keep my rook on e1 open and bring another rook on d1 so to have like both of my rooks on the open files Finally, we reach the main line, knight f6. Knight f6 is absolutely the most common move and people like to do this the most. Why? Simply because they want to complete their development with castles. Nowadays, literally in all top games, you'll be able to see the d3 lines. I don't want to show you this. First of all, we're not dealing here with uh, GMs all the time and secondly it's way more interesting for your level to play d4. Speaking of d4 and the quality of d4 move I have to say that nowadays this line is not anymore that popular. Uh, in the end of the lesson or the way we're just getting closer to the end of the lesson you're just going to realize that there are certain uh, variations where black can uh, fight to equalize maybe in, in, in some variations to even get slightly worse position. So if you want to play this line, you got to pay the price and you got to take that risk. So basically, um, 
in every single line till we reach the main line what is going to be winning and positions will be full of nice tricks but in the main line uh, it could be a bit better for black the choice is all yours so after d4 <clears throat> they can play e takes d4 they should play if they bring the bishop back to e7 you take on e5 knight e4 boom you win a piece you can't even imagine how many games I won like this or my students won like this uh, in the past. Bishop e6, d takes, knight e4, boom, same trick. You win a piece or checkmate. Or if they play knight g4, a well-known trick, bishop takes f7, king f7, knight g5, uh, the knight on d4, g4 is about to drop and also you broke the castle. So that's why they have to take, you take it. And they played bishop before. Uh, many times in the past, I've seen that the, uh, that people uh, even uh, put the bishop back on b6. It's a bad move, and you just have to know how to punish it. So you play e5. This knight has nowhere to go. For example, I've seen many times knight e4 where they keep dreaming of playing d5 and absolutely get a not decent game, good game, because they will maintain the knight in the center, they will play bishop g4 afterwards and everything will be fine. A key move in white strategy is bishop d5. Knight has nowhere to go, they gotta play f5, this knight has nowhere to, 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 to step back, they play f5, now the short castle is impossible, you just play knight c3, remove this knight away, and now they, they're going to have like unbelievably big problems with the light square bishop. Possibly they can go knight e7, bishop b3 and d5, you will of course use en passant, play castles, bishop a3 afterwards and kill them. If they play knight g4, you kick this knight away and here we go. We're just analyzing one of the most typical tricks and tactics in these positions. So when they go, you go d5 and keep in mind that here knight stands on h6 while the king still uh, remains uncastled on e8 in the center. If they play knight a5, you know that we bring the knight back and we always have that uh, great threat of b4. Uh, if they go knight a7, you just go d6, kicking the knight away, threatening this uh, queen on d8, taking on f6, winning a piece. If they play knight b8, you just go bishop g5, sorry man, your queen is trapped, you gotta uh, keep the queen, but in that case you lose the knight. So just like you see, they can't play bishop e6, they gotta go with bishop e4 check. Here, in the past, uh, the most popular move was bishop d2. I find it boring. Nowadays, uh, I even found some articles and books where a couple of GMs suggested knight bd2. It's nice, but it relies on compensation and I don't think Mm, everyone can play those positions, especially if you're not good with either memorization or with tactics. So, simplest uh, continuation is typical Joko Piano with the knight c3. Uh, and after knight c3, they have too many moves. The main line is knight e4, and that's the best for black. If they don't play this, they can go castles. On castles, you have to be very precise. A student of mine, Ash from England, uh, won a nice game, uh, playing bishop g5, pinning this knight on f6, taking the knight on f6, playing castles, threatening knight e5, and after bishop c3, b takes c3, this guy threatened bishop g4. Mm, after rook e1, you defend this knight on f3 and a healthy pawn structure in a very unusual way. White, uh, you know, like keeps a strong center, defends this knight on f3 and everything is fine. If they play d6, threatening like bishop g4, stopping e5, you just go castles, castles, and not everyone would play the next move. I played a blitz game and played bishop g5 here, but the move is knight d5. You know, threaten a killing bishop g5, they gotta take, you take by pawn, they gotta play like this, and you play this, and boom, we threaten a3 followed by b4, and one of these pieces is going to fall. Very nice trick. In case of knight d5 and h6, so if they don't take on d5, to prevent bishop g5, okay man, you maybe prevent bishop 
uh, g5, but queen a4 is about to win one of your pieces. So you play bishop a5. I keep chasing away. And now I take. You can take by a pawn, you gotta take by c pawn. With the bishop pair, with a healthier pawn structure, with an isolated pawn on d6, uh, double pawns on b7 and b6, unusually uh, broken pawns a7, b7, b6, we definitely have to consider white's position being so much better. And finally, if they play seventh move d5, we take and play castles. Lots of times, my students ask me, what if this happens? Nothing. If they take by knight and take by bishop, it reminds me and resembles on uh, Jocko's uh, game played back to 16th or 17th century when he played queen b3, bishop f7, bishop a3, and plays bishop g8. I very much like this move, bishop g8. Uh, only good tactical players would be able to find it because when they take it, uh, you just go with 95 threatening mate. And uh, this is a very nice trick because they do not have queen e8 to defend because ta -da -da -da, checkmate. So, by the way, you can, develop, you can uh, defend it like this because you're completely pinned. And just because of this, in case of queen e8, you just play rook e1. So they can take on c3 by knight. If they take by bishop, you take. They can't take by knight because check and the piece is gone. So they play castles and here you have a nice developing move. You threaten knight g5, queen d3, bishop a3. They gotta take on c3, I don't see anything else. Queen c2, knight is threatened. They gotta go back and you play bishop a3. They have to play knight d4, otherwise if rook e8 you just take and win the knight. So they have to play knight b4. You play queen c3, threatening knight on b4. They play a5 and just when they think they finally managed to like consolidate their uh, situation and pieces, boom, d5, you open up everything and we're about to go for the mating and crushing attack. That's why they have to take. You go castles. They have to take by bishop. But before we check the main line, let me show you what happens if they take on c3. Most of weak guys... Uh, show the tendency of taking on c3 by knight. Then you play b takes c3, and they can play a couple of ways. Uh, the most famous uh, game by uh, that guy Jocko from Italy played with b and went for bishop c3, queen b3. This guy took on a1, he captured an f7, only move is king, was king f8, bishop g5 threatened the queen, only move was knight e7, knight e5, which threatened both bishop g6 uh, clearance uh, and clearing up the f7 square and queen f3 sliding over the third rank to f3. So when they took on uh, d4, Joko, uh, sorry, Greco played bishop g6 threatening queen f7, d5, queen f3, and after bishop f5, bishop f5. Bishop e5 is the only move and bishop e6 and they can't stop checkmate. After this, bishop g7. Fun fact is that one of my students had exactly the same win like this. Fun fact is that I found like more than 20, 30 games in chess base that ended up like this. So just like you see, uh, they can't take by bishop on c3. What happens if they play and bring the bishop back to a5? You give check and after knight g5, they can hardly defend queen h5 or knight takes f7 with fork. What happens if they play knight move d5? You go c takes b4, rook e1, and then you go with queen a4 check. Why is this so important? Because I played a blitz game like this. Because when they play bishop d7, you play b5. You're ready to, uh, you know, like... <clears throat> import one more pieces into the action. I'm talking about the dark square bishop to play bishop a3, but you also want to take this pawn on c4. After castles, you take on c4. In case of c6, you just play b5 followed by bishop a3. And then after bishop c3, bishop a5 and d5, it's time to see the bishop e7. Once again, I have to mention um, um, the game uh, the game of my student Ash uh, from England who had exact the same game but 
Ash had like a very nice working skills and he learned all the analysis from our lessons. So look what happened in one of the important games where he won the tournament in England. So after d5, this guy played knight b8. He played d6. And in case of c takes d6, bishop f7, queen d5, bishop g5, rook a to e1. And just when you think everything is like cool, this guy sacked the piece for nothing. And they play knight, queen f6, you play knight e4. After queen e5, uh, there is a beautiful trick, knight takes d6. And now you can take on d5 because of checkmate. Uh, lovely mate. In case of bishop d6, you go check, you go bishop g5, you take on f6 and play knight e5. Only players uh, who learn all the analysis will be able to win their games in a very nice fashion like this h5, knight g6, knight takes c7, queen h5, and goodbye baby, checkmate. So just like you see, that's why knight b8 is bad. By the way, I do not suggest you to learn the first move, to say Maya said play d5, and then not to remember why do you do it. Guys, you play d5 not to close the light square bishop, you play d5 to kick the knight away with the tempo, and the next move push that pawn up to d6 and open up your probably key piece, essential piece in attacking, uh, in attack, and that's the bishop on c4. So knight a5, you don't have time, you gotta play d6. Otherwise, if you play anything else, not, not that you lose advantage, actually they take a huge advantage, and you just lose the light square bishop on c4. So they take on c4, you take on e7. If they take by queen, say goodbye to queen. If they take by king, say goodbye to, to the knight on c4. If they take by pawn on d6, you play bishop f7, queen d5, with pretty much the same trick. If they play king f8, bishop g5, knight c6, bishop g5, knight g5, rook a to e1, and you have absolutely the same tricks, or knight e4, uh, knight, uh, sorry, knight e4, queen e5, and knight e6 with checkmate, or rook e3, uh, where your rook goes on f3. Uh, I had a blitz game, knight e7, rook e1, knight e5, rook e8 when I was younger. So just like you see after d4 they gotta take and you take on e7 and you're just winning. That's why none of these moves except bishop c3 is good. And there we go. A very important moment. It's not good to take. It's not good to take because they will play d5 and they, they've just not just equalized they got advantage. So after d5, this is a surprising move, but it's not even that surprising because king is uncastled, it's pretty weak and exposed there, knight on e4 as well on the e file, bishop is under threat, knight as well. Let me show you what happened in a couple of miniatures in the past. If knight e5, you take on c3. Wow, Maya, didn't you blunder the bishop on c4? No, I didn't. So queen d4, threatening both of these knights. They gotta give up one of these knights and position is unclear. But if they play knight e6, many games I won when I was younger. Queen g7, rook is threatened. I take, give check. And when they go on f8, I'll show you that what the same thing happened. The same thing happens. If knight e5, b takes e3, queen d4. They go knight e6, queen g7. So I just show you that the transposition is absolutely the same. If king d8, bishop g5. If knight e8, boom. And the mate is following. King f8, check. This one, rook e5 threatening rook g5. Okay, you want to defend it. No big deal, deflection. But not on g5 deflection. Because if you take, I need g5 square for the mate. If you play d6, no big deal, baby. Knight takes e4 and boom. Knight f6, checkmate. What a nice mating pattern with the knight and the bishop against the king. If knight e4, rook e8, checkmate. So they gotta go with something else. For example, after you play b takes e3 and queen d4 to play castles. You take on c4 or on e4, it's pretty much the same. Bring the queen on f4 and you wanna play like c4, bishop e2. <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, hoping to be able to use like a better development and compensation that you have. So after bishop f6, you play rook e1, knight e4, rook e4. Watch out, you threaten d6. 
Let me just show you another nice miniature. Castles d6. Of course you play d6 in order to uh, open up the light square. Bishop d take, you take. They gotta play knight f5. You play queen d5. Knight is threatened. They go d6, you play knight g5. No, you did not blunder your uh, piece. Don't worry about that because after bishop g5, bishop g5, uh, queen g5, queen f7, and boom, checkmate. How many nice tactical tricks you have in these positions. So after queen c7, you play g4 and uh, get yourself ready for coming down to the river rook e7 and they, they're just about to resign. And after like queen d5, d6, knight g5, what happens if they play knight h6? Nothing. You just play h4 and I claim that in this position, even though engine thinks uh, it's like completely unclear, why is the one who's got a serious initiative? That's why after rook e4, they gotta go d6. And now you play bishop g5, bishop g5, knight g5. This is the most critical position. And whoever wants to play this uh, position with black pieces, he has to learn and know everything up to this point. Actually, he has to know a lot more than this. For example, yesterday I played a blitz game against an FM and I easily won. The guy... Uh, probably he got confused because nobody plays this with white pieces anymore and they probably forget the analysis or don't even believe that somebody will play this uh, Jocko piano. So after like castles, boom, knight takes h7, king takes h7 check and you threaten queen h7 mate. Only move is f5, f6 loses. Queen h7, king f7 and now you play rook h6. The idea behind rook h6 is not to give them knight g6 followed by rook h8. It's a very important move. I'll show you uh, what what do they think and uh, what is like very common in practice. Rook g8, rook e1 to place another piece into the attack also to cut the running possibilities and escaping possibilities for this king. Queen f8 and bishop b5. You do not allow this king to escape. He can play bishop d7. You want to play rook e6 with rook f6. Man, you're about to be completely winning here. And I'll show you the game between uh, two IMs from Serbia, uh, played like 15, 20 years ago uh, in some uh, Serbia uh, semifinals. The guy played rook h6 and another IM played bishop d7. He said that he was shocked that somebody played this line and it's full of tricks. This guy brought the bishop back to e2. Uh, the guy played rook g8, thought that, okay, it's fine, I'm gonna put my king in safety, but after bishop h5, what did he blunder? Rook f6, followed by queen f7. Uh, there is another line, instead of castle, they can play bishop f5. When they play bishop f5, it loses on the spot, you play queen f3. If they play castle, you take on e7, and you've just won two pieces, and that should be a matter of technique. In case they take on e4, you take on f7, give check on e6. Uh, you can uh, keep repeating just to give them like a fake hope, like, man, I don't know how to punish you here. No, of course, you're going to take on e4, play knight e6, rook e1, and they're about to resign. Especially because the king was walking around, so this king is remains weak into the center. And finally, after knight g5, the only move is h6. I played so many games against h6. Uh, usually, I use these systems in faster time controls. So basically, my results are good, but not because positions are too good for white, mainly because I'm just three here in those games. So you just go with either queen e2 or queen a4. Uh, I'm of opinion that queen e2, h takes g5, don't play rook e1, what was tried in so many games in the past. Play rook to e3. Rook to e3 is a very sneaky move. Not too many players are familiar with this move. Point is, if you play like normal, like, I don't know, bishop d7, because you can't play castle, you're a losing knight. I play rook e1. Now you gotta go uh, castle, I play rook e7, I'm fine here. If you play a6, I play rook e1, I'm just showing you the main idea. And everybody thinks like, Okay, I'm fine with this position. No, you're not. That's why I played rook e3. You wasted time on stupid a6, but okay, this is just more like example to show you what are you threatening. You threaten queen h5 mate. They go g6 and you play queen f3. 
Now both of these pawns are under threat and you're just so much better. Queen c3 and the mate is coming or serious material consequences. Queen f8, rookie one, bishop e6, you take bishop d5. That's a nice move. They can't take it because of bishop e7. They gotta go c6, bishop f3 and h3. This is one of those positions that your opponent has to know in order to say, okay, black is... Uh, Black has, I don't know, unclear game or maybe slightly better game, but believe me, it's not easy to play with tripled heavy pieces on the e-file with a pawn on e6. And even though Black is up a pawn, this gives you nice practical chances. And finally, you can play queen a4 if you're not satisfied with queen e2, then bishop d7, queen b3, threatening rook e1. So if they take, you take, and after this play rook e7, position is absolutely fine for you. But in case they play bishop f5, you just go rook to e3, doubling up your rooks. In case they play h takes g5, you play rook a to e1 with fine position. The best is castles, uh, knight f3, so the, this is the best for black, rook a to e1, knight g6, knight e4. And they can't play bishop d7 because of knight a6, so they have to play queen f6. When you take and take, you just bring the bishop back here. Uh, clearly, we had so many threats. Uh, they had to reach like and to know 21 moves in order to like uh, get decent position. Uh, and I think that black is slightly better here. Uh, not much. Uh, we're down a pawn. We do have problems with this pawn on d5. I wish that pawn was on c4, c3, c2, not on d5, but okay. Uh, just like I told you. Uh, this is the price you gotta pay and the risk you gotta take if you wanna play this line and if you wanna play this Juco Piano. Hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, in one of the next lessons, I'm going to present you how to play Evans Gambit. I'm going to present you how to play against uh, anti fried Lever, uh, Hungarian Opening, and a couple other stuff in the Italian, and we're about to finish this. Italian series. Uh, stay safe and see you soon. Bye bye.